Hi, I'm Tony McMahon and welcome to History's Terrorists. Now, you may have seen me on TV as a contributor on history and science documentaries, but I've got another life and that is as a communications consultant on counterterrorism and countering violent extremism. Now, that's taken me all over the world from Central Asia to the Balkans, the UK and the US. Fascinating work. And I'm very interested in this whole topic area, as you can imagine. Also, back in the 1980s, I was something, I suppose, of an extremist myself. Not a violent one, I hasten to add. But I was a Marxist-Leninist and a member of a group in the early 1980s. Now, I never supported terrorism, but it did give me an insight into the process of radicalization and how people adhere to an, an ideology, an ideological cause. What are the motivations, the processes behind that? Now, what I'm going to do in this series, in History's Terrorists, is look at uh, causes, organisations, individuals that we may even have regarded in the past as courageous or heroic, and pose the question, looking back, really, who would we have sided with? Those people, those organisations, or the authorities trying to deal with them? We'd like to think that we'd side with the so-called freedom fighters and so on but we may have actually viewed them as terrorists. So join me while we re-examine some of these people and organisations in history. In today's episode, I'm going to be looking at the Sicarii, who were dagger-wielding Jewish zealots in the New Testament era. I'm going to be asking whether or not we would have sided with them or the Roman authorities. And I'm going to be taking a fresh look at Jesus Christ and asking whether or not he really was a man of peace or an apocalyptic preacher. And let's try and understand why the Romans decided to crucify him. Now let's go back to biblical Judea then. And it had enjoyed a degree of independence for about a century under the so-called Hasmonean Kingdom. But that all came to an end when a man called Herod invaded Judea, yes, that Herod, along with his Roman allies. And he was detested by the Jewish people for having brought to an end this long period of independent rule. Herod was seen as a traitor to his homeland and more importantly, in many ways, to his faith. And in some ways, this echoes the view of terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda, who view their own regional rulers in the Middle East, even though they're Muslim, as essentially uh, infidels, as uh, apostates who are not truly Muslim. It's what they refer to as the near enemy. So you could say that Herod was viewed as the near enemy to Jewish zealots in biblical Judea. And no matter what Herod did to try and prove his piety, uh, nothing was going to be good enough. Even rebuilding the second temple in Jerusalem didn't pacify the population, who doubted all the time that he was even truly Jewish. Into this very volatile situation comes the Sicarii, these dagger-wielding zealots. Our main source of information on them is Josephus. Now, Flavius Josephus is an interesting character. He started out as a rebel participating in the first Jewish revolt, uh, but he was captured and he basically became a turncoat. He, he sided with the Romans, he became a confidant of the Emperor Vespasian and a friend of his son who would later become the Emperor Titus. That is the Titus who went on to destroy the Second Temple in Jerusalem built by Herod. And Titus's soldiers took away the treasure, looted the treasure from the temple, an act you can still see celebrated on the Arch of Titus in Rome today. In his history, Josephus is keen to show that most of the Jewish people did not support the activities of the zealots during the first Jewish revolt, and particularly of that subset, the Sicarii. And I see a, maybe a rather tortuous analogy here with the 1916 Easter uprising in Dublin, where the Irish Republicans who seized control of the post office, for which read Masada, the hilltop fortress of Masada in Judea, they did not have the majority support of the population in Dublin for their action. 
until the British started to execute the ringleaders, and then opinion turned in their favour. Josephus traces the roots of the Sicarii back to a man called Judas of Galilee, nothing to do with Judas Iscariot, by the way. Uh, he was a rebel who opposed the Roman census that was being carried out in Galilee at that time. Now, when Josephus talks about zealots or Sicarii, it's something of an umbrella term for what must have been a whole host of groups at that time. For Judas of Galilee, you can see him as the uh, Osama bin Laden, if you want, of the Sicarii. And the way in which the Sicarii operated, uh, the way in which individuals could be inspired by the Sicarii message and carry out attacks on their own or in small bands, very similar to the way in which people have acted as lone wolves in our own time, inspired by Daesh or Al-Qaeda to carry out random attacks. The Sicarii didn't just reject Roman rule in Judea, they also rejected the temple priests and all those who they believed had collaborated with the Romans. Uh, and that, as I said, was, is very similar to the way that Al-Qaeda and Daesh in modern times have regarded Muslim rulers in the Arab world as being, if you want, quislings or collaborators with Western imperialism. What the Sicarii wanted, what the Zealots wanted, is what a lot of theocratic jihadi extremists want today. They want the replacement of man-made laws with religious law. They want a kind of heavenly rule on earth, uh, which is imposed, though, by violence. Like terrorists in modern times, the Sicarii resorted to assassination, uh, kidnapping and, and other crimes to incite the people to rise up against the Romans. They believed that this kind of early propaganda of the deed would make the spirit of the people rouse and they would uh, rise up to overthrow the Romans. Now, the way the Sicarii operated, they would mingle in crowds and then at a signal, they would bring out their daggers and just basically unleash complete mayhem. And there is, um, there is a view that the Romans went past using the Sicarii for their own ends when it suited them. So, for example, in 58 AD, the high priest Jonathan was assassinated by a Sicarii in the temple precinct. And it was believed even then that the procurator of Judea, Antonius Felix, had basically hired a Sicarii to go and do the job. So when the interests of the Sicarii and the Romans aligned, the Romans went past turning to the terrorists to do their own dirty work. The violence of the Sicarii was really intended to ramp up the pressure in society, to create a pressure cooker environment uh, in which Jewish people would have to choose the course of revolt. And with the first Jewish revolt against the Emperor Vespasian, they kind of got their way. The thing is that as with groups like Daesh and, and Al-Qaeda today, most Jewish people uh, didn't really have time for these terrorists. I mean, I imagine a lot of Jewish people just wanted to get along with their lives and, uh, well, you just pay your taxes to the Romans and have done with it. And what also repelled many Jewish people was the fact that the Sicarii kind of operated like organised criminals. I mean, they saw themselves as heroic, but to many people, they were just thugs and criminals. For example, on one occasion, we know that the Sicarii uh, kidnapped an employee of the temple and used him as a bargaining counter to get 10 of their comrades out of prison. You can imagine this didn't go down well with the population. After early losses, the Romans managed to get back control of the situation during the First Jewish Revolt, and the Sicarii holed up at the hilltop fortress of Masada, and the Romans, and you can still see the ramp the Romans built right up alongside the side of the hill to get to the top of the fortress and storm it. Um, the Sicarii, realising the game was up, decided to commit mass suicide, the ultimate act of terrorist martyrdom. And it must have been like the 1979 Jonestown cult killing, the site that the Romans must have beheld when they entered the hilltop fortress and saw all those bodies lying around. All of which brings us to Jesus Christ, man of peace, who just told people to pay the Romans what they were due and then get on with being good Christians. Well, that's the version that's come down to us, but it may not be true.
Many Bible scholars believe that Jesus was actually more like a, an apocalyptic preacher who was predicting a kind of heavenly kingdom that would descend to earth and would crush the Romans, and that anybody who didn't accept his message would be damned and sent to hell. And if you read between the lines in the New Testament, it's not too hard to find that kind of messaging. Jesus is sometimes mistakenly characterised as some kind of proto-Marxist or socialist. I mean, I don't think he was anything of the sort. He was very much a rebel of his time, and his rebellion was framed in heavenly apocalyptic terms that would seem, well, I was going to say it would seem quite alien to us today, but of course it's all there in the Bible. It's just that that has been watered down, if you want, to a degree. What still comes across, though, is his utter contempt for the Pharisees, the temple priests, the whited sepulchres. And we also see Christ's anger when he goes into the temple and overturns the money changers' tables. And we're even told that he carried a whip that he'd fashioned himself. And at the end, when Jesus and his disciples are holed up in the Garden of Gethsemane, waiting to be arrested... He does explicitly tell his followers to arm themselves. And in fact, when the temple officials come, Simon Peter cuts the ear off one of the officials, although Jesus does miraculously put it back on again. The temple officials are reticent to condemn Jesus to death themselves. And so they take him to Pontius Pilate, the uh, Roman governor or procurator of Judea. And in the Gospel of Mark, the earliest gospel uh, that we have, Pontius Pilate barely looks up as he condemns Jesus to death by crucifixion. Crucifixion being the standard punishment, the most humiliating punishment for seditionaries. In later gospels, we have Pontius Pilate uh, showing mercy to Jesus and even pleading with the mob and putting up a common criminal called Barabbas and inviting the mob to choose between the two. The mob is eventually swayed to choose Barabbas and not Jesus, which doesn't exactly suggest popular support for Jesus and his cause. So maybe like the Sicarii, uh, Jesus wasn't as popular as we thought. Roman accounts of Pontius Pilate are pretty scathing about him. I mean, like many uh, officials in the region, he was utterly corrupt. He was eventually exiled uh, internally within the Roman Empire. Uh, but I have no doubt that Pilate wouldn't have batted an eyelid, wouldn't have thought twice about executing a man he regarded as a terrorist. What we need to be clear about, though, is that Pilate didn't execute Jesus because of his beliefs. Uh, contrary to what's often assumed, Pilate didn't give a damn about what Jesus believed. It was the fact that he posed a threat to the secular authority, to Roman authority. Um, and we see this in a letter from Pliny, the governor of Bithynia, to the Emperor Trajan decades later, when Pliny is asking about what he should do with Christians in his local area. And the Emperor Trajan basically says... Well, who cares, so long as they are loyal, so long as they sacrifice to the imperial cult, what's the, uh, what's the problem? If, however, they don't, if they disobey the law, well, you know what to do. Yet it's clear that uh, many Christians, like modern terrorists, absolutely hankered for the palm of martyrdom. They wanted to be killed. Later on, if you read some of the accounts in the third century of Christian saints who were persecuted uh, in the um, purge of Christians under the Emperor Diocletian, we see uh, Christians begging for martyrdom. They want the palm of martyrdom. And in the stories, even from Christian sources, you can see governors and prefects absolutely exasperated. Why do these people want to die? And you almost have to put yourself into the boots of the governor or the prefect concerned, confronted by a complete lunatic who's saying outrageous things and basically bringing death upon themselves. Uh, and, and you do see governors and prefects giving them the opportunity to say or do the right thing, to sacrifice to the emperor and then be able to carry on their lives and they refuse. So you have to ask yourself, if you had been there in that situation, who would you have sided with? The totally irrational and emotional and rebellious Christian or the rational and, uh, and, and, and uh, governor or prefect who's trying to find some area for compromise? 
Well, OK. I mean, uh, I've been trying to provoke you a bit today, but, you know, it's worth reconsidering these things. What would we have done back in those days? Would we have supported this new Christian sect? Would we have supported these dagger-wielding Sicarii? I suspect most of us wouldn't. I suspect most of us would have sided with the Roman authorities. Well, next time, I'm going to be looking at the wave of anarchist assassinations that swept across Europe and the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, sometimes described as the first wave of modern terrorism. It's going to be a fascinating episode, so please join me then. 